recording. Okay, so I guess an introduction of why what we're doing here. We have our Parsha class on Thursday morning, and we knew that for a while, and we're going to continue to do that, and that we look at a lot of comment commentaries and classic commentaries and Hasidic commentaries. Um, some people are not always available in the morning, so we decided we're going to provide something at the evening, Thursday evening, or Wednesday evening, because it's late, 8.33, and approaching my bedtime, so it's going to be a little bit lighter. Uh, lighter is doesn't mean less important. Lighter does means that not as much text, but hopefully we can find something super powerful every week that could help us uh, take the Torah's message, especially that week's Torah portion's message to heart and help us make it part of our life. Um, we're starting this week because this week is the beginning of the cycle. Uh, we start after Simchat Torah, we start reading the Torah again. And we start with the book of Genesis, the portion of Genesis, portion of Bereshit. Of course, Bereshit is so massive, so many things to talk about that you don't even know where to begin. But we'll begin with the beginning. And especially that this week's parsha, the beginning, at least the first verse, and then you have the Medrash and the first verse, literally talk about the beginning. So the beginning, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. So you would think we have to hear about the big history or prehistory or how things come into being, and we do. But if you look at the Medrash and, and, and quoted in Rashi, so it must be important, it actually, according to Rashi, is connect, and the Medrash is connected to the land of Israel. So how could we not talk about the first Rashi and the first verse and the land of Israel? And we talk about the land of Israel in the literal sense, which we're going to do in a little bit. We also talk about, from the Hasidic perspective, the land of Israel in the figurative sense and what it represents. So this conversation is happening on multiple layers, in the practical, in the spiritual, in the personal, and the journey begins. So that is, uh, that is the introduction. As always, comments, questions, please share. Don't be shy. Don't wait for the end. Um, we begin. So what do we read about the first verse? The first verse people know, everybody knows. In the beginning, God created heaven and earth. Nothing is simple. Even that translation is not, is not, is not necessarily the right translation, but we'll leave that for another time. We'll leave that for Thursday morning. It's too late at night to start getting into the subtleties of the translation. Okay, but well, we hear about the beginning. Now, the big, the real, real question is, where does the story start? And anybody who's writing a story and anybody who's an author, that's the question. Where do you start the story, right? We talk about the Arab-Israeli conflict. When does it start? Did it start Saturday? Did it start in uh, 20, 000, 2005 when they disengaged from Gaza? Did it start in the Oslo Accords? Did it start in Yom Kippur War, Six-Day War? When did it start? And usually the, where you start the story actually influences your story you're going to tell, right? So where do you start your story? Something happened to me yesterday. What can I say? I could talk about how my great-grandfather came to these shores. I could start the story with, I was on the way to the butcher. I, you, could, you could do whatever you want. Depending when you start, that's, how, that's what's going to affect the story. So the question is, where does the Torah start? And the natural place to understand it, Torah starts at the beginning. In the beginning, God created heaven and earth. The problem is, as you may know, because we may have discussed this in the past, that Rashi quotes the Medrash and says, who needs this? Why are we starting from here? It's a wonderful story, but it's irrelevant to the Torah. Well, we have to think about what, why is that, what's the Torah. So I'm going to read the Rashi. I know I promised. I, did, I, I made a commitment that we have no text. But one little text we're going to read. So Rabbi Yitzchak says, it was not necessary to begin the Torah, except... From this month is to you, Exodus 12. We're in Genesis. It says, don't start from here. Start from the middle of book two. Why? Which is the first commandment that the Israelites were commanded. Okay? Now, for what reason did he commence within the beginning? Why does the Torah start with the verse in the beginning, God created heaven and earth? Start with the beginning of the middle of Genesis which is the first commandment to the Jewish people. So that's the question. So before we even get to the answer, we have to analyze the question. In other words, 
what Rashi is saying, what Rashi seems to be saying, quoting the Medrash, what is the Torah? The Torah, before you pick up a book, you have to figure out what, what genre is it, is it? Is it a book of poetry? Is it a book of, of, of history? Is it a book of ethics? What type of book is this? So what is the Torah? So we're starting from the fact that Torah is a book of lessons. Torah is the book of directives, primarily. So if that's the question, then where, does the, where should the Torah begin? The Torah should begin with the commandment. Yes, the history of the Jewish people is a, or, or of, of the world and of, of humanity and the Jewish people is very interesting. Okay, so, so there's different interpretations of what Rashi w- really wants. Some people say, says, don't put it in this book, pass it on orally. Other people say, you can have it in the book, but not the beginning. The beginning is like, is, like, is, like, is like the beginning. The first statement says something that is, rele- that is important, that will catch your attention, that relates to the essence of the book. And the essence of the book is the commandments. So why are you telling me stories? So that's the question. Now, many people like the Torah because of the stories. And when it comes to the commandments, that sort of tune out. But if you ask the Torah, what's the Torah? Torah is lesson. Torah is directed. To start the story, there was a Jewish, there was a there was the Jewish people were in Egypt, and Moses comes and tells them the first commandment. It's a book of lessons. But that is that is the um that is that is the question that Rashi asks. So what is the answer? Now this is absolutely fascinating because what Rashi answers is that we need to start from here for for a political reason. We need to start, start. We need to start from the beginning to make the record straight about the land of Israel. Israel. Whoa! How do we get to Israel? We're at the beginning. We're talking about the creation of the world. We're talking about the beginning before there was energy, before the be, the beginning of everything. No, we have to talk about the beginning for the land of Israel. And here's what Rashi says. So Rashi quotes the verse because of the verse. Rashi quotes the verse in Psalms and Tehillim. The strength of his works he related to his people meaning God told the people the power of his works, meaning the power of creation. God tells the Jewish people how he created the the world. To give them the inheritance of the nations. That's a verse in Psalm, Psalm 111. In other words, God tells us the power of his might, meaning creation, to give us the heritage of the nations. What does that mean? So Rashi quotes the Medrash and it continues. For if the nations of the world should say to Israel, meaning to the people of Israel, you are robbers, you are thieves, for you conquered by force the lands of the seven nations of Canaan. Okay. So obviously it's not a new thing that people say we're conquerors. So this is Rashi writing a thousand years ago. The Medrash is written 2000 years mm-hmm. ago. And we have a problem. People in the world are going to say we're thieves. We stole the land from the seven nations, seven Canaanite nations. There's seven nations. Canaan is the most prominent. So we call it the land of Canaan, the land of Canaan. But really, there were seven nations there. So people are going to say we're thieves. So we will reply. They will reply. The entire earth belongs to the Holy One, blessed be he. He created it and gave it to whomever he deemed proper when he wished. I'm sorry, to, 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 to whoever he deemed proper, period. When he wished, he gave it to them. And when he wished, he took it away from them and gave it to us. That's the end of the Rashi. That's the first Rashi of the Torah. What is Rashi saying? Why does the Torah start from the beginning? Not because we care about creation, at least not because we need to hear anything about this. We have a problem. People are going to come to us and say, the land of Israel is stolen. We're thieves. We stole the lands of the seven nations. So to explain and answer that claim, what do we say? We say the land belongs to Hashem. Now, there was a time period where Hashem gave it to the other nations. At a certain point, he took it away from them, gave it to us. But the entire world belongs to Hashem. And therefore, he has the right to give it to us. So that's the Rashi. So that's the question. That's the answer. So that's the beginning point. The beginning point is the beginning of the Torah. All of Genesis is here to establish the strength of God, meaning the power of God, the fact that the world belongs to Hashem. And if Hashem gave us this land, it's our land. And the fact that we took it from other people, no, it was given to those other people by God. At a certain point, taken away from those people, given to us. So this is a very, very profound, profound idea that just so sort of politically, what is our claim to the land? 
And like I said before, when you ask, um, when you want to tell a story, what is the beginning of the story? If you want to tell the story of the, the history of the conflict in the Middle East, what is the beginning of the story? So when you want to talk about what is the what is the ultimate, what is the what is the what is the uh, bedrock of our claim to the land? Now you can have all kinds of fancy claims, legal claims, other claims, but what is the bedrock? And this is what the Torah tells us: the bedrock of our claim to the land of Israel is that God gives it to us, and God promised it to us in the Torah, which is a holy book, which was accepted by, of course, you know, billions of people on this planet. So that is the political answer and the political uh, interpretation of this. We'll take the question and then all well, questions, and then we're going to see how the Rebbe interpreted this to mean to have a spiritual meaning as well. And the spiritual meaning, it applies not only if you're arguing with somebody about our right to the land of Israel, but also, of course, in the battles that each of us uh, experience in our lives. But both elements are important. You can't ignore, you, can't, you cannot ignore, ignore the, uh, the, the real world, but you also have to remember that there's also a spiritual world within ourselves. Um, and again, just to just to reiterate, one of the things that I've always spoke about is that when 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 the when the Jewish people speak about the land of Israel, the UN, to other governments, they don't always say this. They don't always say it's our land because God gave it to us. Even if they're speaking to believers, they don't always say this. And they've always wanted people to say this, also because it's the truth, also because it works. Okay, go ahead, Vicky, please. Um, thank you, Rabbi. I don't know if I should wait to the end. Maybe Rabbi addresses that. Uh, but why don't we make the question even broader? So we start from the beginning to explain why do we need to actually listen to commandments? Because everything is created by Hashem. So he created it in order to establish those rules, not, not to kill and uh, others. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure I fully understood. I'm not sure I fully understood. Well, if you say that the the book is the Torah is a book of commandments, so why should we listen to the, to this the, those commandments? So that kind of explains it. Why? Because everything yeah. was created by Hashem. Okay, so that's so that so, so what you're saying is correct, and what you're saying is correct, and that's why most commentaries explain that the question is not really. The question is not really why does the Torah tells us about but tell us about the creation. The language, the way Nachmanides puts it, Nachmanides says that if you don't tell, I mean that's the foundation of a Torah. What do you mean? Tell us about God. How would we know about God if not Genesis, right? So yes, yeah, so of course we need to know about God and we need to know about creation. That's not but that's not the debate. That's not the question of Rashi. the 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 question is why is this the beginning, or why does it have to be written, right? In a book, you have the Constitution. The, con the Constitution doesn't necessarily tell you why you should accept it, the values behind it. That could be in the Declaration of Independence. That could be passed on orally. But in the Book of Law, you say the law, right? Now, the story behind, the values behind, you could either say it orally, you could put it in another book. Or like many people say, put it in the back of the book or in the middle of the book. The statement, the beginning, is in some ways the most important part of your story. What's the origin? What's the origin story? What's the beginning? What matters? Tell us that we were a people. Tell us that God communicates to us and there's a commandment and that should be, that should be, that should be the opening according to the Medrash. And, and again, people are trying to understand what, what the Medrash means, but maybe we get this spiritual interpretation, maybe it will help us understand it even better. So let's 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 wait for the spiritual as well. Okay, what is this, what is what what is the spiritual interpretation? Why we need the spiritual interpretation is because it's a little bit strange. You're saying the Torah sets up its order for us to tell the because someone in the UN is gonna is gonna question us, right? That's why we change the Torah. The Torah itself is gonna change its own order to accommodate for for someone questioning. In other words, really, we should have started with something else. But only because we have a political problem and someone's going to ask us a question, so we have to start from here. That's a little bit interesting it, it, to say that the Torah is, is, is changing what it would want to do for the sake of answering a questioner. Really, I mean, it's much more, 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 more interesting. It's much more logical to say, no, the Torah is for the, for the Jewish people. So somehow or another, this conversation has to be relevant to the Jewish person himself or herself. 
And here we get to the mystical interpretation. The mystical interpretation is there is a metaphorical Israel, holy land, and then there's the metaphorical land of the seven nations. And the Kabbalah explains, comes from, the Rebbe quoted this from his, from the third Chabad Rebbe, Tzemach Tzedek, and Tzemach Tzedek quoted from an earlier Kabbalistic work. So this is something that goes back a while. There's the metaphorical land of Israel, and there's the metaphorical lands of the seven nations, the seven nations that lived in Israel before, excuse me, before, um, before the Jewish people conquered the land. What does this mean metaphorically? Metaphorically is we have land of Israel is holiness and the seven nations, the land, nations of Canaan is physical and it's natural and it's not holy. It's mundane. What's the problem? The problem is that each of us are engaged every day spiritually in a conquest. We are conquering the lands of the seven nations. We're dispossessing the seven nations. I know that's a politically charged world word, but spiritually that's what we're doing. We're transforming land that belongs to the seven nations, and we're transforming it to the holy land. How are we doing it? Anytime you take something that is mundane, that is not holy, so that gets its that, that's that's a mundane concept. It's a physical concept. If you're going to use it for a holy for a holy purpose, you now transformed something physical and made it something spiritual. So at this point, what you did is you conquered land and you made it holy land from mundane land. But now the question becomes: the seven nations claim who gives you the right to do this? In other words, there should be a separation between heaven and earth. There should be a separation between physical and spiritual. And some religions, by the way, that's the way they do. They have a house of worship. You go there once a week. You pay your dues. You spend the time. And the rest of the week, you're, you're sort of on your own. Okay? So that's the claim. The, the claim, the spiritual claim is that you have a spiritual domain in your life. You have the material domain in the life. This should be separated. And each person and each domain should be separate. It should be the holy land and there should be the land of the seven nations. But what kind of business is this that you're taking the land of the seven nations? You're taking mundane activities. You're taking mundane experiences. You're taking physical objects and you're transforming that to make it something holy for God. You're taking something physical and transforming it to become something spiritual. And that's the question. How do we have the right to do it? And the answer is that's God created. The entire world, God created the mundane, gave it to the realm of the mundane, but the purpose was not that it should remain mundane. The purpose was that it should be transformed and made into the holy land. Just like we said in the, in the simple interpretation of the Medrash, God owns the entire world. God gave the, were, the, the, the land to the seven nations and then gave it to the Jewish people. Same thing. God created all of the world, both the physical and the spiritual. The physical was not in the domain of holiness. But then at a certain point, God wants us to transform and make the seven nations, the land of the seven nations, which is a metaphor for all material objects, and make it holy by using it for, for something holy. And it's very interesting that if you look at the at the verse that Rashi quotes, the Rashi quotes the Medrash that quotes the verse from Psalms, the power of God's might he gave to his people to give them the inheritance of the nations. That again shows that this story is a story for the people. We have to understand this. We have to understand the purpose of the Torah. And yes, the purpose of the Torah is commandments. We'll have many commandments in the Torah. But according to the spiritual interpretation, the most important part of the Torah, the most critical part of the Torah, in some ways the goal of the Torah, is not so much the commandments, even though the commandments are very important. The goal of the Torah, the beginning, the most important statement of, excuse me, the most important statement of the Torah is that everything belongs to God. God created everything. What does that mean? That means ultimately everything in the world could be transformed to holiness. It may take a long time. It may take thousands of years. And we can get into the into the details because in the physical, in the spiritual world, some things are mundane, and we could transform them to holiness relatively easily. Easily. But then there are some things that are negative, and we're supposed to stay away from them. But on the final analysis, they too can be transformed. Because if I'm supposed to stay away from something, 
But then I, for whatever reason, I don't. And I get connected to the negativity. And the negativity pulls me down. But ultimately, if I repent and if I use that experience as a transformative experience, ultimately, I transform that negative energy as well. So in the final analysis, everything in this world ultimately was created by God. And therefore, everything in this world could become the land of Israel. And that's the depth of, of, of this idea that the Torah, yes, commandments are important. And yes, we're supposed to, we have to fulfill God's commandments. But there's something even more fundamental, even more powerful than that. And that is that the things that are mundane, they're not holy. It's not a mitzvah. But the beginning of the Torah talks about the power because everything was created by God. Therefore, everything can be used in one form or another. Ultimately, everything could be transformed and everything ultimately will be transformed. It may take time. And the story of the Torah is the beginning of, we have five books of Moses, and this is talking about the process and the uh, uh, um, how history is moving forward, but not without its challenges. And after the Torah concludes, after the five books of, 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 the, of the Torah conclude, history continues, and we have ups and downs. But ultimately, the most positive, the, the most, the, 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 the statement of the Torah is that because everything was created by Hashem, not just the commandments, not just the Holy Land, but everything was created by God. Therefore, ultimately, everything could be transformed. And therefore, there is no claim, how are we taking mundane and transforming it to holiness? Because God created it to be mundane, but the purpose of God creating it to be mundane was that we take it from the mundane and we bring it back to the holy. So this is the story in short. We have the three layers. We have the verse. We have the Rashi. We have the simple interpretation of the Rashi, which is political, sort of most practical side, that, that the Torah begins with Genesis to make the claim that God, the world belongs to God. And if God promises us the land of, of, of Israel, it's our right because it was gifted to us by Hashem, who's, who's, who owns the entire earth. And that's the bedrock. That's ultimately the foundation of our right to the land of Israel. In addition, on top of that, there can be many other rights. We have the historical rights. We have the legal right. We have all kinds of rights. But ultimately, the most, the, 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 the true, the, the bedrock, like I said, is that God gives it to us and the land belongs to God. And then we have the same conflict within our life because we look at physical and we look at spiritual and we look at it as a dichotomy. There's a division already in the first verse of the Torah. In the beginning, God created heaven and earth. And heaven and earth is separate. The two day each are separate. And a lot of the story of Genesis is the separation between the holy and the mundane. You have Cain and Hevel. One works the earth, one, 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 one serves God, etc., etc. So much of the Torah is about the dichotomy. And at, at the surface, it looks like the dichotomy is real. But the opening statement of the Torah is, ultimately, everything was created for Hashem. Ultimately, everything is uh, could be elevated and transformed and should be transformed from the mundane to the holy. So that's the story in short. Thank you all for joining. We'll finish a few minutes early because it's very late. Uh, comments, questions, of course, are welcome. Uh, we'll close. We'll close this so then everybody.